86 summer's gone by Bambino put a hex on the bean He was living on a tear and a sigh In the shadow of the Bronx machine Man, you could feel his smolder Hold down at an attitude And you get a little chip on your shoulder Say something that's downright rude Oh, damn, them Yankees Outspending everybody two to one Picking up on the cream of the crop Stealing everyone's favorite son Angels of a family Here are prayer We have been chastened We have been patient Grandmama was a family fan Even at the grand her holding my hand Taking me along for the ride She was born in 1918 Last year that the Red Sox won Back then when they sold the babe Something that they never should have ever have done Ain't that a can I have cook Here comes a hot dog man Look at that just broke. Gee, that's got to kill his hand. Riding home on the green line, watching the town go by. Nana made another Red Sox fan till the day I died. That was back in 65. Doesn't seem like a long time ago. Grandmama keeping hope alive. Watch them win in double O. time of your life, live, so that in that wondrous time you shall not add to the misery and sorrow of this world, but shall smile to the infinite delight and mystery of it. So wrote Sir William Saroyan, and so Roger Steinert lived his life. At every turn, with a twinkle in his eye and an infectious, subtle grin, which to me always seemed reminiscent of the beguiling smile 
that da Vinci captured in the Mona Lisa. My name is Ralph Clayman, and I was invited by April and Dr. Garg to MC Roger's Celebration of Life. In 2009, I had the good fortune, as then Dean of the School of Medicine, to follow the unanimous advice of the members of the UC Irvine Department of Ophthalmology and appoint Roger as the new chair. Everything you see around you is what Roger built over a five-year period, thanks to his vision, pun intended, but true, his kind tenacity, and his multitude of friends, many of whom are here with us this afternoon, and so many more like Jim and Kelly Mazo and Terry Belmont, who just could not be here at this moment, but are certainly present in spirit. Also, as you came in today, I hope you signed the celebration book, sipped Roger's personal spirit of choice, a combination of gin and vodka graced with a blue cheese stuffed olive, aptly called a Steinert, and received a brochure as well as a tear-shaped piece of dichroic glass specially made for this occasion. Roger loved the dichroic glass and was directly responsible for it becoming the beautiful suspended centerpiece in the foyer of the Gavin Herbert Eye Institute. What is special about dichroic glass is that its color changes with the light. Indeed, as the light wanes or when placed against a, back, a black background, the color becomes ever richer and stronger much like Roger from the darkest of times, his true colors shone brightest. Over the next hour, you will be hearing from Roger's colleagues, friends, and family. To be sure, when all is said and done, there will be tears, but you will go home warm by the memory of the grace, the kindness, and the humility of the person that has so become part of all of us, Roger Steinert. And so I will turn this program over to Vice Chancellor of Health, Dr. Howard Federoff, and ask him to please come to the podium and share his reminiscences with us. Howard. I've not known Roger as long as many of you have, but he made an indelible impression upon me as I was arriving in the summer of 15. At one point, I recall we were discussing books uh, that I was reading, and although we never got to really a discussion of those books that were revered by Roger, this quote from Atul Gawande, uh, the author of Being Mortal, uh, seems apt to describe my perspective as Roger as a physician. We've been wrong about our job in medicine. We think our job is to ensure health and survival, but really it is larger than that. It is to enable well-being. I've come to learn and admire things about Roger beyond his excellence as a clinician and a researcher, his love for family, his love for his patients, and his passion for teaching and working with residents, fellows, and colleagues. And of course, his love and passion uh, for the Red Sox. If you didn't already know, it will be possible uh, for you to uh, witness such a uh, liking of the, the Red Sox if you spend a little bit of time in, in Roger's office. Like many of us here, Roger spent a good part of his life in academic medicine, helping others and teaching the next generation of physicians. He was committed to our mission, which is to discover, teach, and heal and also Roger embraced the fourth dimension, which I think is equally important, and that is to serve. His passion, humility, and selflessness in pursuit of these missions were evident in everything that he did. The university exists to shine a light on the world, to provide a beacon of hope, and advance the well-being of our fellow human beings. We all play a role in this in one way or another. However, there are people who, through their innate leadership, and passion are indispensable to the university's existence. Roger was one of those people. As a young physician, Roger saw the future of ophthalmology. His achievements are well documented, and many will talk about this later. Um, his early recognitions that later, lasers would revolutionize his chosen field, his pioneering role developing their full potential, and his leadership in getting new treatments approved and accepted. Roger's second act after coming to UCI in 2004, including revolutionizing corneal transplantation and leading to the creation of this magnificent building. Along the way, he picked up numerous honors and recognition for his clinical and research achievements, as well as his commitment to teaching. But Roger was more than the sum of his accomplishments and awards. For a generation of ophthalmologists, he was a leader, a teacher, a mentor, a friend, and a valued colleague whose daily commitment to excellence provided inspiration and guidance. 
I look forward to hearing what some of Roger's former residents and fellows will share about him later. <clears throat> this legacy will live for the future, for future generations through this spectacular building, the Gavin Herbert I Institute, and an embodiment of Roger's leadership, his persistence, and yes, of course, again, to underscore his vision. His family referred to Roger as Superman, and to those of us who had the privilege of knowing him, he was, in fact, just that. We've all learned something from Roger, perhaps nothing as important as the dignity and resolve with which he faced his final battle. Sometimes the most simple goal can provide the foundation for a lifetime of achievement that improves people's lives around the world. I'll leave you with a comment Roger made a few years ago in an article about his groundbreaking approach to corneal transplantation in which he said, what could be better in life than to help to preserve and restore vision? And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Michael Stamos, our interim dean of the UC Irvine School of Medicine. Michael. Hello, everyone. April, I want to thank you for this opportunity to say just a few words because I know there are a lot of people that would like to say a few words, and I appreciate that you asked me to, to do so. I also want to thank you for sharing Roger with us for the last 13 or so years here at UC Irvine. It's meant a lot to, to a lot of us, so thank you. When I think of Roger, I think of a lot of things, but I think of um, the word gentleman and I think of the word respect, and we'll come back to that in a second. But uh, I have a lot of great memories of Roger. That, that The one that uh, someone already mentioned was the twinkle in his eye, and it really was there. Uh, it was just present. You could see it at all times, except when he wasn't happy with you. <laughs> <coughs> and that was when you got the stern look and the way he would say my name, Michael. Uh, a lot of people call me Mike. I prefer Michael. He knew it, and he used it effectively when he was making a point. Roger and I had a very unique relationship uh, that changed over the course of the Baker's dozen years that we worked together at UCI. I was really blessed to get to know him from such a variety of angles that I think it might be unprecedented. First, it was as a colleague and peer, then it was, it, was, it was as a friend once I got to know him and he got to know me, and then it was as his patient, uh, and then as a treating MD for a loved one of his, and then as my dean, and then as his dean. And then most importantly to me as my mentor, as one of my mentors. Roger taught me a new language. Now, I still can't read an ophthalmology medical record note. Uh, I still would need an interpreter for that. Although I learned what a pinguecula is and how it's different than a pterygium from my own personal experience. Roger taught me the language of clarity and purpose in communication because he was so good at that. No interpreter was needed for Roger. He was always very clear and his integrity was unimpeachable. He really did serve as an example and a beacon for those of us helping to lead UC Irvine to greatness. When I recently had a chance to review his CV and reflect on his accomplishments and what was clearly important to him, his family, his friends, his colleagues, his professional life, it gave me hope for myself in terms of aspiring to reach the heights of professional and personal accomplishments that he did. We had a few similarities which would give me hope. We served in a variety of parallel roles, vice chair of our departments, interim department chair, department chair, holding an endowed chair in the name of a former chair of our own department, interim dean, uh, and even president of our individual professional organization that had the same abbreviation, ASCRS. I'm a colorectal surgeon. <laughs> that was a similarity that uh, Roger and I got a chuckle over, especially when we got each other's emails and mails. And then the paths diverged, and, and Roger set a precedent that will be hard to imagine anyone else achieving. Just think about what he accomplished just in the last uh, three or four years. He had the vision, as mentioned, and successful effort to create an eye institute, the bricks and mortar that are this building, based off of philanthropic, uh, philanthropic uh, contributions that were possible only because of his passion and efforts. An endowed chair in his own name just this past August. Breakthrough accomplishments in research by his team, including novel stem cell therapy for retinitis pigmentosa to prevent blindness. And his passion, as we know, was to prevent preventable blindness. And these are just a few of the things that he accomplished, and we know that. And we should celebrate Roger's life as we will today and recognize this great man and the legacy he created. Even in his final months and weeks, he continued to strive for more achievements for his department, for his friends, for his family. The words I would use to remember him are respect and loyalty. I've been so impressed by the loyalty he engendered, and those were really born out of his actions, which guarantees he will not be forgotten. 
for despite all of his amazing accomplishments that you'll hear about even further today, he will be remembered far more for the way he conducted himself in his life than for what he created. Thank you very much. I'd like to now ask uh, Associate Vice Chancellor for Administration, Rebecca Brasuelas James, to uh, come up here. April, thank you for asking me to speak here today. As Michael noted, it's truly an honor, as I know there's probably a line a mile long of people that want to discuss what Roger meant to them. I don't really possess the adequate words to convey what Roger really meant, so instead I'm just going to share two memories of what really personified who Roger was to me. I first got to know Roger more than just as a chair when the construction of this building began. I was on the committee alongside him that dealt with the building space and planning, and I was immediately impressed by Roger's passion for the design and construction of this space. This was not just a building to him. This was the culmination of a lifetime of work to see a dream come to fruition. Roger was involved in every single aspect of space, design, color patterns, furniture, the tiles, you name it, Roger was involved. He cared deeply about the patient experience in this building, but also for that of the people who would work here daily and care for the lives of those they served. This meant something to Roger. This was not just a place to work. This was a sacred place to care for people and heal. If one wants to feel closer to Roger, they simply just have to be in this building. The second time I got to work more closely with Roger was when he became interim dean back in 2014. Having just finished up a significant and major five-year turnaround, finding someone to fill the very big shoes of Ralph Clayman had many of us concerned and a little nervous. Well, I can tell you all of us in the dean's office breathed a huge sigh of relief, and we could not have been happier when we were told that Roger had agreed to serve as interim dean. He was so highly regarded as the chair of ophthalmology, but I was always impressed by his calm demeanor that was matched only by his strength and perseverance of excellence. Simply put, Roger Steinert was a man who got things done. I have never in my life met someone with the strength and determination of Roger, except only matched by April. He was a man that my father would say had true grit. I remember sitting with Roger in our offices at the medical center five days after his first brain surgery. Five days. We were, he was in a suit and tie. We were in our medical center offices going over the coming year budget. Someone had snapped a photo of that moment and we sent it to our chancellor to let him know that our medical school leader was alive and well and back in the saddle and getting things done. Later that week, I was told the chancellor was having a meeting with all of the UCI deans and one could not attend because he had a headache or upset stomach or cold or something. The chancellor then held up Roger's picture and said, if Roger Steiner could come to work five days after brain surgery, what's your damn excuse? <laughs> Roger loved that story. The smile on his face made it, made it all worthwhile. I am deeply saddened that Roger is no longer with us. I could go on about more stories of what he meant and the deep kindness that he and April showed me and my husband through our journey. I have to say while I'm saddened, I feel better knowing that a world existed where Roger was in it at all. And more importantly, that you and April, he found, you found each other, you loved, and lived a life that has touched and blessed so many. I will be forever grateful for having passed through this life getting to know him. Thank you. With that, I will invite Dr. Barry Kupperman up to this podium. Dear friends, all of us here, in one way or another, have known and loved Roger. He was an inspiration to us all as a person, surgeon, clinician, leader, teacher, mentor, and friend. I treasured our relationship with our friendly give and take, expressing the pseudo rivalry that always exists between corny and retina, our, rel our relative subspecialties, sort of jousting for the supremacy of the eye. I trusted Roger's judgment in all things and always found myself learning from his example or his words. He was the older brother I never had and would have wanted to have had. I can tell you unequivocally that the best job I ever had in my life was to be a prince in Roger's kingdom. He was a remarkable and extraordinarily dynamic chairman and visionary leader. Confidentially, 
I'm currently in dialogue with Dean Stamos to possibly be the next chair here at UCI if all works out. Candidly, it's a job that I never aspired to since it was so wonderful to serve under Roger his, with his incredible leadership. If I am, in fact, fortunate enough to be the next chair here at the Gavin Herbert I Institute, I do it largely to honor Roger, to try to carry on his remarkable work, to continue his transformative vision of the miracles that he believed could, that could be accomplished here at the Gavin Herbert I Institute. It would certainly be the professional honor of my life to serve in Roger's footsteps and to use the traditional expression to stand on the shoulders of giants. In this case, it was never so true since Roger was truly a giant of our field. All of us here at GHEI certainly mourn his absence and will dedicate our lives to continue the vision of eradicating blindness that, uh, that Roger always believed would be possible one day. Thank you, Roger, for sharing your life and experience and passion with all of us. We are better people because of you and your incredible example. We will miss you always and hope to honor your memory by being the best we can be in all of our efforts. Farewell, Roger, and bless you. Thank you. I'd like to introduce uh, now Marjan Farid, who's the chief of our cornea service here at GHEI. Marjan. Thank you so much for having me here, April. Thank you so much. There's so much I can say about Roger, and I don't know how to and where to even begin, and I've just been trying to put my thoughts together. Roger and I started here at UCI together 13 years ago. I was a first-year resident when Roger got here, and I just remember um, being in awe of this amazing man, surgeon, clinician, human being, and when I, I got accepted to his fellowship, it was like the world had been given to me. It was such an honor and a blessing. And he became more than my mentor. He became a father figure to me. He became someone who passed every, everything to me generously, his knowledge, his wisdom, how to be a human being, how to be a doctor. And um, I think I was his first recruit when he became chair as faculty member. And um, ever since, everything um, that I have um, had in my career and every accomplishment I have made is because of Roger, is because of his generosity and be because he took me under his wing and he pulled me up and always said to me, you're, you're like my equal. And I knew that wasn't true, but he said that to me and he treated me like that. And, I can tell you that from this moment forward, every accomplishment, every project, every, um, everything I do in this career and for ophthalmology will be in his name and in his honor and, and um, for him, because my aspiration was always to, to make him proud of me and um, he will be always with me in that way. Um, there's one quote that I thought is so fitting of who Roger was. And I'd like to read that because it really embodies all of his virtues and, and the man and the, and the doctor he was. Be generous in prosperity and thankful in adversity. Be worthy of the trust of thy neighbor and look upon him with a bright and friendly face. Be a treasure to the poor, an admonisher to the rich, an answer of the cry of the needy, a preserver of the sanctity of thy pledge, be fair in thy judgment and guarded in thy speech. Be unjust to no man and show all meekness to all men. Be as a lamp unto them that walk in darkness, a joy to the sorrowful, a sea for the thirsty, a haven for the distressed, an upholder and defender of the victim of oppression. Let integrity and uprightness distinguish all thine acts. Be a home for the stranger, a balm to the suffering, a tower of strength for the fugitive, be eyes to the blind, and a guiding light unto the feet of the erring. Be an ornament to the countenance of truth, a crown to the brow of fidelity, a pillar of the temple of righteousness, a breath of life to the body of mankind, an ensign of the hosts of justice, a luminary above the horizon of virtue, a dew to the soil of the human heart, an ark on the ocean of knowledge, a sun in the heaven of bounty, a gem on the diadem of wisdom, a shining light in the firmament of thy generosity, a fruit upon the tree of humility. This is who Roger was. Thank you. 
Thank you, everyone, for um, being here. My name is Sam Garg. Um, I had the pleasure of working with Roger for many years. Um, so I have um, the pleasure of speaking on behalf of myself and also Jim Mazo, who wasn't uh, able to be here. So I'll start with my own comments and then, and then move on to Jim's. Um, a lot of this we've heard already, and uh, it'll be a little repetitive, and I apologize for that. But um, it'll be easier for me to read than try to, try to come up with it on my own. Um, so everyone here knows about Roger's contributions to the field of ophthalmology. And uh, as Dr. Fedorov said, Roger was more than the sum of his accomplishments and awards. For a generation of ophthalmologists, including me, he was a leader, teacher, mentor, friend and colleague whose daily commitment to excellence provided inspiration and guidance. He was able to approach almost any, any situation with a cool and collected demeanor, unlike what I'm doing right now. He approached obstacles with a friendly smile, always keeping things in perspective. I really, really admired that about Roger and learned a lot uh, from him about that. But Roger was more than my mentor. He was one of my best friends. I learned so much from him, not just as a doctor, but as a person. One of the things I'll miss most about him is his sense of humor. We shared many, many good times together and many laughs. I would also like to take a moment to thank April, his loving wife, and the rest of the Steiner and White families. Thank you so much for sharing Roger with us. We all know that he would not be the man he was without you guys by his side. Thank you to Roger's friends, many of them who are here, who have become friends of my own and, and mentors to me. Um, really, it spoke highly of, of Roger. You know, He spoke so highly of all of you, and, and I could see why you guys were all friends. Many of you shared the same qualities that he had. Roger, one of the greatest gifts uh, ever given to me was to be mentored by you and to call you a friend. It is symbolic that we remember you um, the day before Father's Day. You were like a father to many of us, especially me. You know, people, you know, people say, you want to be like Mike? Well, I want to be like Roger. Um, your legacy will live on in those you have trained, and we will strive to make you proud. I love you and will miss you daily. Rest in peace. So I have a few comments from um, Jim. Um, he's sorry he couldn't be here today. What can you say about a man such as Roger Steinert? Where do you begin? How can you capture the man in words? We have, truly, we have lost a truly great man, a remarkable man, remarkable for his exceptional accomplishments, remarkable as a great doctor, an expert surgeon, an innovator, and educator, remarkable as one of the greatest leaders, innovators, and experts in ophthalmology one of the world's, most, uh, world's foremost experts in cataract surgery, corneal transplantation, and laser refractive surgery. Roger was highly regarded and admired by his colleagues and peers. He was beloved by his patients and students. First and foremost, though, he was a friend, a personal one for me, but also a friend of many of people. Roger was a man of intellect, but mainly, Roger was a man of heart, a man of soul. They say the windows are they say the eyes are, to the, are, are the windows to the soul. Perhaps this is why he loved ophthalmology, because he loved people. He loved helping people, helping restore sight and their quality of life. His work and his life was dedicated to helping others, to helping people see, to exploring new ways to use technology to its fullest to save sight, to find new and innovative ways to advance vision care, to make life better for millions of patients around the world and to teaching others how to preserve and restore vision and to provide the best vision care for every patient. This was his work, this was his passion, but also his joy. He was once quoted as saying, what could be better in life than helping to preserve and restore vision? He instilled this passion for vision, for excellence, for pushing beyond and for helping others in his lifelong commitment as an educator, training the ophthalmologists of tomorrow. It is hard to conceive the Eye Institute without Roger. He built it, what it is today, and what it will become tomorrow. He loved teaching and sharing what he knew, but more so in sharing his passion for vision and the quest in finding new and better ways to help others. Only one more page, guys. Um, his illness did not stop him. He continued to work and be engaged in, in the ophthalmic community. Up until just a few weeks ago, Roger still came to work every day. He said, what else am I gonna do? I'm so grateful to be have given this much extra time. This was Roger, a man of gratitude, a humble man, a likable man. 
The accomplishments and awards of, of uh, Roger are myriad. He has been recognized and celebrated by every leading ophthalmic and vision association, but he didn't do it for the accolades. In fact, he would tell me he didn't like the recognition, but knew that it was part of the job. He was devoted to his patients and much beloved by them for his extraordinary care. Many of his patients were the rich and famous, but this did not matter, matter to Roger. He was devoted to each and every one of his patients, regardless of their station in life. He was a caring, uh, he was caring and gave each undivided attention when he was with them. Roger was devoted by his students, his residents and fellows who saw him as the future, who he saw as the future, excuse me. He was never tired of working with them and sharing his knowledge. He was inspiring and uplifting. He was an inspiring and uplifting mentor, but teaching also inspired him. He saw promise for vision, for vision care and the future of ophthalmology in his students. Roger was a remarkable clinician and surgeon, but on top of this, Roger will remember it as one of the most inspiring, most generous, and most likable individuals, and he had a great sense of humor. He loved his Red Sox. He thoroughly enjoyed a good laugh, never at anyone's expense, but always smiling. It was contagious. Roger was a great husband to April, a tremendous family man to his kids and grandkids. When he wasn't working at the office, he was working around the house. He was a handyman and used, and used love and his knowledge of engineering to maintain a beautiful home. He loves the outdoors, skiing, paddle boarding, and walking. His love and devotion to April was beyond just loving her. He respected her, cherished her, and adored her. I am honored to call Roger my friend. I will remember Roger mostly for his humility, his generosity of spirit, his caring, his love for his wife April and his family, and for his friendship and smile. Roger, there is a hole in the world without, with your departure, and there is a hole in my heart. I will miss you. Next, um, I have the pleasure of um, inviting up uh, Gavin Herbert to the podium. Well, <clears throat> April called him Superman, and indeed he was that. You know, I, I've had an opportunity over the last 60 years to get to know most of the leaders in ophthalmology. And I, I can tell you that Roger was a very special one and uh, so happy that he took the leadership to create this eye institute. Ninette and I had a, a chance to be with Roger in April just a few days before he passed. He was at peace and smiled, and although he couldn't talk, I think we were able to communicate visually. And we talked about the future of the Eye Institute, and I was happy to learn that April would like to stay involved in the Eye Institute to help carry out Roger's goals for the future. And which include a significant expansion of our research efforts. I'd like to share with you some thoughts that uh, Janet Briggs wrought. Janet wasn't able to be here, but I thought her, her words were, were quite wonderful and on target. Roger was our friend, our leader, our champion, our teacher, our empathetic listener, our courageous pioneer, our rock of Gibraltar, our pillar of grace, integrity, and respectfulness. He was the face of our center, our founding director, someone who literally rolled up his sleeves and sh shoveled dirt, wore hard hats, while all the time teaching uh, our doctors of the future and caring for patients, and making those discoveries that improved the lives of so many. Uh, you know, Roger's legacy will live, live on, and I think uh, he's, he's one of those people uh, that you'll always remember in your, in your mind. Uh, I think you'll always be able to, to visualize his smiling face. And so thank you, April, for sharing him with us. And uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. David Karcher and Steve Lane. While I never had the good fortune to train uh, under Roger, I certainly had a number of opportunities to work with Roger on various clinical projects and, and various studies uh, throughout the years of our friendship. Probably, however, the, the greatest work that we uh, did were the number of hours and laborious hours that we spent in the lab. Some people might call it something different, but we called it the lab 
to actually come up with the Steinert cocktail. I really want to thank uh, April and the family to allow me to say a few words about my dear friend Roger. It's appropriate that this memorial service is being held in the house that Roger built, for it exemplifies and embodies so much of who Roger was. The center has a brilliant design that is innovative, well-organized, well thought out, modern to the point of being well ahead of its time, yet warm and embracing on each and every level, without a lot of glitz, without a lot of glamour, yet great attention to every detail. Care was taken to construct this building with an eye to the future, for surely expansion would be needed to maintain its eminence in perpetuity. Are these not the attributes of Roger Steinert? Brilliant, innovative, well-organized almost to the point of compulsion, a clear practical thinker with an eye on the future, a warm and caring person who had tremendous integrity, who took more pride in the accomplishments of those he trained than in his own achievements, which we all know were formidable. While all these features, as well, of, as well as all those expressed by the other speakers, are accurate, I believe there is even a better description, descriptor that, in fact, is just a single word that describes Roger best. It's actually a Yiddish word. For those of you unfamiliar, Yiddish, Yiddish is from the Jewish language based upon German, and we certainly know about Roger's German background. The word is mensch. Literally, mensch translates to man. But like so many other Yiddish words, it has such a nebulous definition while at the same time is so far reaching. In essence, it means a good person, kind, gentle, generous, sweet, warm, thoughtful, considerable, charitable, and the list goes on and on. As Barry said, Roger was the big brother I never had. Our times together were memorable and notorious. We were a bad influence on each other, staying up way too late, well beyond when everyone else went to bed, smoking cigars and drinking Macallan single malt, or of course, the famous Steinert, oftentimes catching a little snooze in a comfortable chair, only to wake up, drink still in hand, picking up our conversation between laughs. Roger, you made me a better person, and I already miss you. But be assured that even though you are gone in body, your spirit and memory will keep you very much alive in my heart. My name is Dave Karcher. I'm the executive director of the other ASCRS. <laughs> I met Roger um, in 1982. Uh, on my first visit to Boston, prior to selecting Boston as our annual meeting venue for 1985. When I met Roger, shook his hand, and we sat down and had a cold beer, um, I knew that I had a, an instant friend. Um, absolutely incredible uh, experience. I told him that he should probably be uh, employed by the Boston Convention Center because he was so enthusiastic uh, about our potential of, of meeting in Boston. Our meeting lasted at that point for about an hour and 10 minutes. And after that meeting was over with, the decision had already been made to then meet in Boston, which was a very, very, very successful, very successful meeting. I could stand up here uh, all afternoon and talk about uh, Roger's contributions to, to our organization. Um, I don't think there's any one individual who has, has had more to do with the strategic direction uh, of our organization. So much for that. Um, Roger was a, was a true friend, and April, um, Ann and I, um, I can't, can't express our, um, our, our level of um, appreciation for the friendship that we've had. Um, our trip to the south of France on the barge and our trip to Russia 
where Russia, where Roger was a, a, a guest speaker. Can I tell the vodka story? Huh? All right. So, so, not, not, well, this was, yeah, no, 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 I'm not going to tell the horse story. So, so anyway, we were invited to Professor Fyodorov's um, Arabian horse farm uh, one day for lunch. And so we got there, and there was a, a short program with the horses and this type of thing, which was very, very, very impressive. So after that little show, we went into this barn area where it was incredibly set up uh, for this wonderful, wonderful lunch. The problem was our host was someone who I had run into before, and he was the director of Fyodorov Security, who was a Russian general and a retired KGB um, fellow. So, and he was famous for his multi-tose of, of vodka. So before the, the lunch started, he started off on these toasts. And so we're going on and on and on. And I looked at Roger after about 45 minutes, and his cheeks started to get a little rosy. And, and I'm sure mine were as well. Um, did a couple more toasts, only to find out that the general was drinking water. <laughs> so the lady who informed us of that said, I will pour you water as well. So we, whoops, we finished up that, that, that lunch, which lasted for about three hours, uh, drinking toasting water. Uh, it, it, was, it was quite an experience. I won't tell the horse story. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to find words to, um, to explain our admiration for, for Roger and April, their perseverance, their courage, their love for each other, and for their children and grandchildren. It has been an honor to know Roger, to have shared a part of his life. And if we can take away a small part of his kindness, his grace, and his dignity, we will all be better for it. Rest in peace, my brother. Hello. As so many have said, and I have to reiterate, that one of Roger's greatest gifts was the fact that whatever relationship he had with you, you felt like it was special than any other relationship he had with anybody else in the world. I'm not gonna cry. Roger and I had one of those relationships. We first met 22 years ago when I became the clinical director at OCB while Roger was president. And right from the get-go, we had a great relationship. Uh, several years later, when I was able to entice my very good friend, April, away from the practice we used to work at, to join OCB, I believed I earned his lifelong appreciation. But it wasn't always good times. Um, there are several that I could think of, as Michael had said earlier, when Roger wasn't happy with you, you knew it. And one of those days, I received a page on my pager, tells you how many years ago, come here, RFS. So I promptly went down to his exam room and walked in, and he was unhappy with me because of a staffing snafu. In other words, I had stolen one of his texts and given them to somebody else. And he stood there for five minutes, reaming me out. April's in the room with him, reaming me out about how I ruined his schedule, ruined his day, probably ruined his life. And I very respectfully slammed the door, stamped back to my office. By the time I got back to my office, my light's flashing on my phone. And there is a message from Roger telling me that I should be honored that we have the type of relationship that he can yell at me like he did. <laughs> Trust me, I saved that message. And there were other times that Roger made me feel incredibly honored. We still joke about a great time at an Ascris meeting, and we're in the Vizix booth negotiating the new contract. April, Roger, and I are there with all the suits. And I had concerns with one of the stipulations in the contract. Roger looks over at me, pats my knee, and says, don't worry your pretty little head about it. I'm like, there goes my negotiating skill right there. Thanks, boss. But he did always show respect, always kindness. As we get to be closer friends than we were colleagues, boss, employee, um, he became a mentor to my children. 
we still joke about the time that Roger unwillingly was the only male at a trip of four women and ten children under the age of nine going to Storyland. Monica remembers the day. Yes. Roger didn't mind. He's like, well, where are the other men? Oh, no, no, no other men. He went on every ride with the kids. He probably had the best time ever. And he was the one kicking and screaming when it was time to leave. That was the type of man that Roger was. Roger showed every person, as you've heard from so many, it did not matter whether it was a technician, whether it was one of the fellows, whether it was Julia Child, or whether it was the cleaning lady. If they had a question for Roger, Roger would spend probably too long answering the question, which would just make his clinic run into overtime. But that's the type of man he was. Wasn't always good times. About a decade and a half ago, Roger broke the news to me that he was following his dream and coming to Orange County and taking my best friend and her family with him. He promised me at the time that it would not change our relationship, and he did everything that he could to keep that promise. Since that move, whether it was meetings, Hawaiian Eye, or Ascaris Academy, NEOS, you name it, we were there, we were always together, or vacations, either on the vineyard, up at Vale, here in Orange County, games at Fenway, he made sure that we stuck together and that we always stayed in contact. His promise to me was that it did not matter miles or time. We would remain as close as we had always been. And he kept that promise to the very end. I miss you, Roger. And always will. <laughs> okay, done with the crying. And so not to be outdone, our next speaker is going to tell you how he had twice as good a relationship with Roger and knew him for five times as long. That would be Dr. Carmen Pugliafito. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sharon. Uh, Gavin, you'll be happy to know that the University of Southern California is well represented here. We have our leadership. We have our dean, Rohit Varma the head of our cornea service, Dr. Bradley Randleman, and perhaps most importantly, my wife, Dr. Janet Pine, who was a classmate of Roger at medical school. And thank you all ophthalmologists from all over the country that came here. I know that Roger would be thrilled to know that you're here. I knew Roger Steiner for 48 years. We met in preschool. <laughs> it's, it's frightening to say. Uh, actually, I met Roger about three weeks after we started Harvard College, and we went through medical school, residency, fellowship, and faculty, uh, early days of faculty together. And Roger was more than a friend. He was a partner. And that partnership changed both of our lives. I'm the guy that told Roger to become an ophthalmologist. He was going to become an orthopedic surgeon. I'm the guy that told Roger about lasers. We went everywhere together. We went to the White House. We actually had a comedy routine together for a while. An extraordinary man in every way. Roger practiced in Boston for 23 years. 22 of those years, he was actually in private practice. I was the inside guy, he was the outside guy, but he was really a clinician scientist nonetheless. And he had achieved a role in Boston you know, the clinicians in Boston think that Boston is the medical capital of the world. And he had ascended into the pantheon of greats. He had operated on two secretaries of state. He had operated on at least one Nobel Prize winner. And he'd operated on the entire Massachusetts congressional delegation, giving them all apparently free LASIK. I don't know. <laughs> he operated on Julia Child, the French chef. Roger told me that in addition to the uh, an autographed copy of the, the cookbook, he got cooking secrets. That was never verified. <laughs> when the last Boston Brahmin ophthalmologist retired, Henry Freeman Allen, this guy was the great-grandson of Harriet Beecher Stowe, author of Uncle Tom's Cabin. He lived in her and practiced in her house. There was one, only one ophthalmologist that would fit the bill of taking care of those old Boston Yankees. Roger Steiner. But I came to know Roger because we shared scores of patients together. As someone whose compassion 
extended to every patient. He never saw a patient because they didn't have money. And I saw him treat patients from the backwoods of Maine and New Hampshire, patients with disastrous injuries, calamitous eye problems, literally sitting in the chair, trembling in fear, fearful of two things, losing their vision and being in the big city of Boston. Most of them have never been there. But that's when the Steiner touch was at its greatest. Roger gave, always gave every patient his undivided attention. You know that. Their undivided attention. And he, he not only solved their problem, was, was so reassuring and enveloping with his kindness. That's the Roger Steiner that really I came to love and to know and is reflected in everything here. Finally, Steiner was a builder because, of fact, he was a Steiner. His family had a great tradition of being in the construction business. And Roger was always very good with his hands. Had some crazy ideas about building stuff. His children are laughing. Built a, a micro keratome. Built many houses. And you can see in this wonderful institute the integration of form and function. That's Roger Steiner, 30 years of his background doing it. I have some thank yous on behalf of Roger and myself. First of all, I'd like to thank the administration of, of UCI because you never gave up on Roger, even after his illness, and you permitted him something that he really wanted to do, and that is to die with his boots on. You know, weeks, weeks before he passed away, I met with him for one and a half hours in his office, and he was on the ball. So thank you very much for that. I'd like to thank the wonderful clinicians at UCI that really helped Roger and gave him the best care and extended his life beyond any of our expectations. I'd like to thank the faculty at UCI who took care of him. I saw this, I witnessed this in his last days and making sure he was comfortable and cared for. That's extraordinary. And finally, of course, I'd like to thank April. April is a gift from God, gift from God. Roger and I used to call each other Kimo Sabi. I think that was his idea. You know, that term that, that the Lone Ranger had for Tanto, Kimo Sabe. And it was always unclear who was Tanto and who was the Lone Ra Ranger in our relationship. But in the end, I'd say, farewell, Kimo Sabe. See you on the other side. Without a doubt, my father was a man of tremendous achievements. Whether it was cataract surgery videos on the TV on Saturday morning, or falling asleep at his computer in Vail with his finger on the F key while working on a lecture, my dad's hard work was an inspiration for us all. He brought the same level of dedication and commitment to everything he did, from building the largest model train set I've ever seen to helping, i.e. making, uh, me and my siblings eighth grade science projects. My father invo invo invoked in me a passion for outdoor sports, specifically rowing and boating, and of course, skiing. I'll always be grateful for, to him for the long drives he committed to every single winter to Vermont so that we could improve our skiing. Later on, in his adult age, he took up snowboarding and was determined to explore areas he wouldn't have been able to ski down, even taking it a bit too far. I, was, I vividly recall a couple years ago finding ourselves in the Bulls and Vale where he got stuck at the top of a cliff and where we had to call Ski Patrol. <laughs> we renamed them Rogers Cliffs in his honor. My father also instilled in me my love for baseball and particularly the Red Sox. Even when, we, when he moved across country, he was a loyal fan, watching games and keeping score. Throughout my childhood, we would go to games at Fenway or follow them on the television. I will always be a fan, thanks to my father. All of this continued even when my father fell ill. He continued to work and travel and live life through friends, sports, and of course, wine. Just about two months ago, he accompanied me, my wife, and my son for hours around the playgrounds and his swimming pool despite being wheelchair bound with a cheerful smile on his face every day. 
We will all miss him very deeply. My father had a favorite quote that he drummed into me from the, the time I could remember. A good toast has a beginning, an end, and no middle. My father had lots of good advice, and I managed to follow it about 75% of the time. So, Dad, I'll try. I've had a lot of time to think about what I would say in front of you all today, and you would think that that would make it easier to come up with some way to sum up Roger Steiner in a few words. It doesn't. You've heard some of the many things that people remember about my dad, but we've only scratched the surface. He was truly good at everything while being mostly humble about it. But like so many things in life, as I was struggling and down to the wire, uh, something that I definitely get from my father, inspiration came from the place I least expected it. I got a call from my oldest friend, Bill Schwitter, who grew up next door to me. He said, Adam, I heard about your dad. I'm so sorry. When my parents were moving houses a while ago, they found something. They, they sent me all sorts of crazy stuff, but they sent me something that made me think of your dad. I'm sending you a picture. And I opened up my phone and I looked at my text messages. And there was a photograph of a Bill's Pinewood Derby ribbon from when we were both in second grade. And I choked up. I said, Bill, I, I don't have that ribbon, but I've still got the car. And Bill said, I was going to put a block of wood on four wheels and send it down that track. But I remember, your dad would have none of it. He sat us down and he gave us a lecture on aerodynamics and friction, and he made me work until we had something that he could be proud of. Mine, a metallic cherry red dragster with a fully functional spoiler just in case the wheels lost contact with the wooden track. I'm sure the judges believed that an eight-year-old did it on his own. That was my dad. He pushed all of us far beyond our very best. And he did it with a smile. And we kept going because we knew that whatever we did, he'd have done it even better. I'm gonna miss you, Dad. Okay. First, I'd like to take a moment to thank all of our family and friends and every member of GAGI and our UCI family um, who made today possible. Um, really, without you guys, I mean, of course, this is the house that Roger built, but um, it, it's a house you also built. You all built it together. Um, you were a team. And um, he recognized that, and he loved you all very much. Um, I also want to thank Roger's Garden for the beautiful flowers, and it just, everything looks just gorgeous. Um, I'd also like to express my gratitude uh, to those of you who traveled the distance to be here for the celebration of Roger's remarkable life. I know it's not easy, it's Father's Day tomorrow, so I, you know, want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule and uh, coming to be with us. So as, you know, I feel like I'm echoing what everybody else said, um, if you Google my Roger, you'll see thousands of citations linking you to his plethora of accolades, titles, patents, book chapters, peer-reviewed papers, accomplishments, and surgical prowess. What those links cannot show you was his prolific humanity and humility, his love for all six of his children, grandchildren, family, and friends, his wicked sense of humor, his selflessness, his love for his patients, his love of teaching residents, fellows, or anyone with a question about ophthalmology for that matter, because um, we all know that was his passion. If you asked, he listened. Uh, two ears, one mouth, a phrase he lived by at work and at home. He was a determined man, 
by the way, determined was his word of choice, not mine. I called him stubborn, and he would reply that he was not stubborn, he was determined. Well, that determina determination bought us more days than we had ever hoped possible. Um, when he was diagnosed, we were told 14 to 18 months, and we said, absolutely not. That's not going to happen. We're going to have more time than that, and we did. Um, he battled against the scourge of glioblastoma with dignity, grace, and a ferocity I've never seen um, in another human being. Oh, and that sweet, loving smile. I cannot begin to tell you how much I miss it. Every morning when we would greet the day together, how much I miss leaning over to him and repeating what I say to him virtually every day. It's kind of a little joke. Um, have I told you how much I love you? And he would reply, no, no you haven't, and smile. <laughs> you know, C.S. Lewis uh, said that no one ever told me that grief was so much like fear. I am not afraid, but the sensation is like being afraid. And he was so right. The uh, fluttering of the stomach, the anxiety, the loss of appetite, and the ability to sleep. But um, just like fear, we can't let it control us. Uh, we have to control it. I choose the latter because I'm convinced that he is with me. And I believe he's here right now, that he will continue to walk beside me, us, for the rest of our days. I just, I just have to. I truly wish I could stand up here today and something, say something so profound that it would ease all of our suffering and our deep sense of loss. But I can't. It's something we're all going to have to work through on our own and our own time. But our memories are ours, and his death cannot take them away from us. Uh, we can let grief ruin us or teach us gratitude for what we have, which is what Ro Roger will no longer have the opportunity to enjoy, but we do, and that's life. We live on. And let's Roger live on through our actions and our charity. That is the gift that we can give him. To reward him for all the joy he's given each of us, every, and every person in this room has experienced it. Now I have a favor to ask of all of you. I want you all to close your eyes, just for a minute. And I want you to visualize Roger. Pick a memory of him before the illness before it began to chip away at his physical abilities. See him, feel him, and embrace him. Tell him how much you love him and that he is always welcome. Ralph Clayman sent me this piece when I was really, really, really um, struggling. And it's by Pablo Neruda, and I'd like to share it with you. If I die, survive me with such sheer force that you waken the furies of the pallid and the cold. From self to self, lift your indelible eyes. From sun to sun, dream through your singing mouth. I don't want your laughter or your steps to waver. I don't want my heritage of joy to die. Don't call it my person. I am absence. Live in my absence as if in a house. Absence is a house so vast that inside you will pass through its walls and hang pictures on the air. Absence is a house so transparent that I, lifeless, will see you living. And if you suffer, my love, I will die again. So I want to thank you all for being here and for sharing um, in Roger's celebration. He was a remarkable man. And um, like I said, we have all of those wonderful memories with him. And we need to remember those when we're feeling down. Now, if you'd all please reach under your seats and uh, grab the hat and put it on. As you all know, Roger is a diehard Red Sox fan. And among many of our favorite things about Fenway Park, the tradition of singing Sweet Caroline was on the top of our list. So let's do Roger proud. You have the lyrics. And serenade him to Sweet Caroline. And I think uh, somebody's going to cue this up because I do not have the singing voice to carry this on my own. I need so. you for this one. Let's, um, actually, I'm going to come down. Let's all stand and... Um, Where it began I can't begin to know it But then I know it It's growing strong 
was in the spring And spring became the summer Who'd have believed you'd come along Hands Touching hands Reaching out Touching me Touching you Good times never seem so good I've been inclined To believe they never would But now I look at the night And it don't seem so good with only two And when I hurt Hurting runs off my shoulders How can I hurt when I'm here with you Warm Touching warm Reaching out Touching me, touching you, sweet Caroline. Good times never seem so good. I've been inclined to believe they never. All right, we're coming up to the last chorus now. I'm going to need everybody singing out. Are you ready? Take a deep breath. Here we go. Sweet Caroline. Good times never seem so good. I've been inclined. Times never seem so good. I've been inclined to believe they never won. Sweet It's amazing that Neil Diamond would come out for this, but that's appropriate. <laughs> I'd like to thank April so much, and uh, that was just, just really good. I'd like to also thank Dana Collinson, Dana White, and Jenny Tom, and so many others for organizing this bittersweet moment in time, but also this celebration. Please, if everybody would proceed downstairs to the reception in the GHEI foyer, or if you want, mingle here and knock back a few more Steinerts and sing Sweet Caroline. I don't think Neil's going to stay for that. Or tour the GHEI and spend a moment in Dr. Steinert's office. Um, you'll walk away from that a whole lot better. Lastly, for those of you who are interested in supporting the GHEI and Roger's ongoing aspirations for ophthalmology at UC Irvine, there is information on the back of your brochure and at the registration desk in the foyer. Thank you all for being with us today. Your presence has been both a healing and a blessing.